Good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the first HSM webinar from Man and Machine. My name is Sean. I'm one of the application engineers here at Man and Machine. Today we're going to be going over an introduction to HSM for advanced power modeling. We'll jump through a couple of slides, then we'll jump into a demo at the end. What is HSM? What are the benefits of integrated CAD CAM? Moving to a demo at the end, showing you how I take a part from design into manufacture. So what is HSM? HSM is an integrated CAM package. It's designed to sit inside of either Autodesk Inventor or SolidWorks. This means that unlike PowerMill or HyperMill, you do not need to export models and re-import them into a standalone CAM environment. It's all handled inside of the CAD package, whether it be Inventor or SolidWorks, with a simple switch over to the CAM environment from the ribbon at the top of the page. What are the benefits of an integrated CAD CAM package? You're able to make changes to parts without the need to recreate all of your CAM parts. This is one of the advantages of an integrated CAM package. So if you go, if you have a part, you've done your tool paths, your designer comes along and says I need to make a change. You go back into your CAD environment, make your changes, move back into your CAM environment, update your tool paths, and everything's done. Many companies who develop and manufacture their own parts and use separate CAD CAM packages for no the hassle of having to import an updated part into their CAM package. Change all of their boundaries, contours and features that they've selected for their original part. And this can take time, it can incur mistakes, and with an integrated CAD CAM package this, this is taken out of the equation. Because when you make a change, any of that associability between the CAD and CAM hasn't been lost. If you've chosen a pocket that you want to machine, if you change the size of that pocket, it's still a pocket, it's still there. The CAD package and the CAD package, no, it's still a pocket. When you then regenerate your tool paths, that sociability has been kept, you don't have to select anything. It updates for you, changes the tool path as needed. This moves me on to my next point, and it's great for being able to make customizable parts. So if you've got a company who's, say, making furniture, like a bench, and that customer is able to offer their customers the ability to change the length of that bench to any size that suits their needs. So let's say your original bench is a metre long and your customer, your customer needs a bench which is a metre and a half long. You go into your model environment or your assembly, you make the necessary changes to the part, pull that back through into the CAM environment, update the paths and all of the tool paths you set up that you know are run, you know well, are all changed to updated to that part. And talking of changes then, let's move on to our last point, the ability to take parts from design to analysis through to manufacture. And this is something that Autodesk has implemented with their changes to their product design and manufacturing collection. You can now take a part from one package, just one collection, you can take a part from concept into either Inventor or SolidWorks, design that part, Take that part into an analysis environment, which, which is NAS in CAD. Do any analysis, verification you need to do to make sure that, that part is working as it's designed to. And take that part through into HSM, and manufacture that part, generate some G-code, get the part out into the machine. So with that all said and done, with the PowerPoint over with for now, let's move over to Inventor and take a part from design into manufacture. So here we are in Inventor. I've got a couple of sketches I drew earlier, just to save a bit of time. Let's design this part. So first off, I'll make sure I'm in my CAD environment. I'm going to do a revolve. So I select revolve. I'm going to select this profile and choose my axis. I'm going to revolve around this axis. And generate the first part of the part. Now I can see I need to make. A cut through here. So let's extrude this cut and select this. Tell it you want to cut and we'll go say 20mm deep just to ensure that that is going all the way through the part and we'll click OK. We can see we're going to need to make a hole as well. We'll extrude this one, same process, click OK. Now my designer told me he wants five of these slots equally spaced around the outside 
and three grub screw points for fixing to another part. So instead of having to recreate all these drawings, all these sketches, what we can do is we can pattern this around this cylinder. So I'm going to come up here and select pattern, I'm going to select circular pattern. I'm going to go along to the tree and instead of having to click on everything and what I need, I can select it from the tree or you can select it from here. So I'm going to select this pocket, I'm going to select the axis, and I'm going to tell it I want five placements, 360 degrees, I want the rotation to rotational instead of fixed. As you can see, I now have five placements. Click OK, and it's recut everything for me. Now let's take this hole and equally space it three times in the same fashion around the circumference of this diameter. So I'm going to take this feature, same rotary axis, this time I only want three, and we'll click OK. So here's our part, we've designed it. Now let's take this into manufacture. So this is easy, as I said before, up in your ribbon, up in your ribbon, we have this cam tab. So click over this cam tab and this brings us into our cam, our integrated cam environment. So the first thing we want to do is we want to make set up this part. So we hover over this, and this tells us exactly what, do, what you want to do. Specify the work coordinate system, stock geometry, fixtures and machining surfaces. So let's click this, as you can see a new tab has opened up here as well, and brought up this dialog box on the left here. Now in the camera environment, most of these dialog box, if you work from top to bottom and left to right, generally you can't go wrong. So we've got this part, and I know on the workshop we've got a free Haas ST30Y, nice mill turn machine. So let's make this a mill turn part. If you hover over this, you can see that you can do milling, turning, or cutting. So in this instance, we're going to do turning and mill turn. Now I want to machine this from front side. I'm going to say that this has already been machined from the back. All we're having to do is machine the profile, this bore, the holes, and the pockets. So we need to change our z-axis first. So to change this, we simply click on a face. As you can see, our z-axis has changed direction, the direction we need it in. We can even choose our x-direction as well. I'm happy with it where it is. Now due to these pockets, we need to tell this is a spun profile. What a spun profile does, some touch, I'll read it from here. Some turn parts require subsequent milling operations. In these instances, the turning profile needs to be generated before the milling begins. This feature allows you to generate 2D sketch profile through the x-axis of the mill turned part which can then be used for turning. So with my x-axis here, if it was to draw a part through here, it may pick up this pocket. We don't want it to do that as when we turn, when we do our profile across the top, it's not going to, it's going to dig in here or it's not going to see it. What we want to do is tell it to spun profile which allows us to make it the shape of the actual part. So we'll click Spun Profile, leave our tolerance as it is. Now we need to move into our stock and tell it how big our stock is. So we have some choices. We can make it a box, make it a relative size box, we can make it a cylinder, a relative size cylinder, a tube, relative tube, or we can choose a solid. So if you're doing this from a casting or a previous operation and you've got an STL model of your previous operation, you can choose make it a solid. We're going to use a relative size tube. So by default, HSM is set to round up to nearest 10. And as you can see, even though I've told it only one mil stock, it's rounded up to the nearest 10. So if you've got a 96 mil model, you've allowed one middle, one mil on the diameter, that's only 97. So it's going to round up to the nearest 10, which is then 100. So it's going to add another three mil on. We don't want this to happen. We just know it's one mil on the top, on the radial. We want to add a couple of mil to the front to allow us to take some off the front. And we're going to be holding on some stock in the back. So let's say we've got a nice big bar inside of our chuck to hold on to. And we can move into our post process. This is where we can name our programs, where we can add a comment to our programs, where we can change our work offsets, and if we have multiple offsets. In this case, we'll leave it as it is. So it's a common program name. It is 1001. So we'll click OK. This is our setup complete. We now have a setup here which shows our stock. 
and where our WCS is. So now we need to start adding some toolpaths to this model. So let's start off with some turning parts, toolpaths. We'll add a face mill. So let's face this. So as you can see, it's now generated this stock. So now it sort of knows what you're trying to do. So let's go into our tool library. When you click tool, it opens up this dialog box, which has lots of sample libraries, your own personal libraries, tools that you may be using at the time, and tools for the document. So I'm going to use my sample library, scroll down, and you can see there's this turning tools here. I'm going to select my turning tools. This then gives you standard options for some turning tools. So I'm going to use standard, right hand, quite short, even use a, use a sharper one. Let's use a sharper one for today. And we'll select this. It's probably best to use a sharp one because I need to get into this corner. So this is now doing a face mill up. Because it's a tube, it knows it doesn't need to go to the center point, and it needs to go to there. So without any further commands, I'm just going to click OK. As you can see, the toolpath has been generated. If I go to setup, we have this option up here to simulate. So I click my setup and I click simulate. This is going to move me into a simulation environment. So as you can see, I've got some stock. I can turn this on and off. I can turn my toolpath off, on and off. I can turn the whole toolpath on. Before, after, I like to trail it so I can see what it's done once the tool's moved. So let's click play and see what it does. So there we go. It's skimmed the part, top to bottom. Nice and easy. So let's say we've got a little bit more stock on it. It hasn't quite got rid of that first bit of stock. It's probably due to the, the, diamond, this, the pitch of this tool. So let's go back in and we can change this tool. So we'll go back in and we'll edit this tool. We've seen a problem straight away. We'll change the tool. So let's choose this nice standard one. Click OK. Let's look at the simulation for this one. As you can see, this is more suited for facing. It's now done what we wanted it to do. Now we want to do a profile of this. We need to finish this part off. So we come up here to our turning environment, our turning toolpaths. We'll click turning. As you can see, the dialog box comes up. We work from top to bottom. And left to right, going through our options, changing what we need to change. So, first of all, we need to select our tool. So, let's select this tool. Let's select this one instead. So, let's select this tool. We want flood coolant on. We want it to go home at the beginning and the end of the toolpath. We want to profile the outside. So, this means the outside of the part. If we wanted to profile the inside, so say a boring, we would tell it to go to an inside profile. This would allow us to bore the inside of this, say with a boring bar. It seems to be doing an outside profile, let's choose profile. Without any of the changes, we'll click OK. As you can see, this has generated a toolpath for us. So let's see what it does when we simulate it. Skim the front. It's going to come along to the profile and go all the way back to the edge. So that's the profile done. What I did notice is that this is over machined this front. We've already machined this front. We don't need to do this anymore. So let's edit this toolpath again. And if we go into our geometry, we can tell this to rest machine. So we can tell it that we want it to look at the previous operations, which is the face milling and not go on there anymore. So now as you can see it's not roughing it, it's only doing a quick finish over it and doing only roughing what it needs to rough out. So now we've done a facing, done a profile, let's move on to the milling side. So first off we want to mill this ball. So let's come up to our 2D milling side, we'll select our board operation. So now we open this dialog box, and as you can see, it's the same as the turning one. The only difference being is this is now a milling tool instead of a turning tool. 
So let's pick our tool. So let's say we'll go with a 12 mil end mill. Let's select this and have a look. And this doesn't look very, doesn't look long enough. You may want to adjust the length of this tool. So to do this, we go back into our tool. And we can edit this tool. So we want to change our body length. So say 35. That looks better. It looks like it's more likely to get that ball now. So now let's move into our geometry tab. Now this is where we need to tell it what we want it to machine. So now we just click on us, our pocket, our ball, and we can now see it's selected that ball. The problem is we can't really see whether it's going through or not. This is a bit of a problem. So up here on the ribbon, we can go to our view. We can change our visual style from shaded with edges to a wireframe. So now we've got a clear picture as to where that bore is stopping. So this bore is stopping at the edge. Now this isn't ideal, so we want to change this. So let's go to our heights. Now we have a top, we have a clearance height. As you can see, these are all, you can even pull and drag these to where you want them. That was fine at 10, so I'll move it back. What we want to change is this bottom height. This bottom height is currently the bottom of the hole. We want to say, okay, let's go two mil through the bottom of this hole. And there we go. As you can see, it updates. And that is now going two mil through the bottom. What we also don't really want to do is this pitch is really sharp. So let's go over into our passes and have a look at our pitch. This is a one mil pitch. We know that we've got one mil on the side, but using a big 12 mil car, we can easily do two and a half mil cuts. So let's change it to that and we'll click OK. Now let's move back over and we'll simulate this and have a look at how it's doing now. So first of all, it's going to rough, it's going to face, it's going to do our profile, select our boring tool or our milling tool, it's going to come in, it's going to bore that pocket for us. Let's skip to the end of that, so as you can see, that's bored through. In the simulation, we also have this show part comparison. When we click on this, it shows us the part, and the blue is the stock. So as you can see, our part is now being machined out, and all, this part, all the part is finished, other than the part where it's blue. So we now know we need to do these pockets and these holes. So now I don't want it in wireframe, we'll go back to our view. We'll change our view to our shaded with edges. So now let's do this pocket on the side. Let's go back into our environment. We'll go 2D adaptive this time. So if you ever want to know what the toolpath does, hover over it for a few seconds, unless you turn this option off. I wouldn't suggest it. It's always handy to have up, and it only shows up if you hold over it for a few seconds anyway. It will tell you what it's doing. Taper angles can be defined for any water islands. Creates a roughing operation that uses more optimized toolpaths that avoids abrupt direction change. 2D bucket creates a roughing operation that uses toolpaths parallel to selected geometry. So it essentially offsets the geometry as a standard pocket would. We're going to use our 2D adaptive for this operation anyway. So we want to do this pocket. Now, I know these rads are 5 mil. So I'm going to go in and I'm going to select an 8mm eight mil tool so that we, don't, we can always roll around our corners. We can finish with this tool as well. So now we move into our geometry. If I try and select this pocket, it's not really going to do it properly. So what I first need to do is I need to change the orientation of my tool. Because my orientation is this way. And I want my orientation to be up. So when we are into here and we've got our tool orientation. Now we can tell it which way our tool is facing. So we select our Z, we select, we choose our Z. Now, as we can see, our WCS has switched around, our Z's in the wrong direction. So we come over to here and we can flip our Z direction. X in this sense doesn't matter, so we can leave our X where it is. Now we come up here and select our pocket. There we go. Now our pocket is selecting correctly. What you want to do is you want to look above your pocket and make sure this arrow is on the correct side. So it can be either side and it will machine the side that it's on. So this is showing that it's going to machine the inside of this pocket. So let's move over to our heights, because again, we don't want it machined to the bottom. Check our bottom height is our selected contour. We can see our selected contour is the bottom of this pocket. I'm going to go a little bit further through. So we'll say go 2 mil past. Check our passes. Everything looks fine. We've got some stock to leave on. And we'll click OK. So 
pretty quick to generate. As you can see, it's generated our toolpath with our trochoidal milling. Let's machine that pocket out. Now we want to finish that pocket. Now we could go through the same process selecting, but we've already done that selection. We've selected the geometry, we know how height we want, we know the tool we want to use. So what we can do is we can use this toolpath and all the geometry that's selected to go back through here, we can create a derived operation, select our 2D contour, because we know we've got everything selected, we can move into our passes, make sure that our stop to leave has been turned off, select OK, and there we have our finished path. This is really quick, this is a really good way to use the same tool, the same geometry over and over again. So we could do the same and we could work around our tool, work around our pockets if we want to. But as we did when we designed this part, we can circular pattern these tool paths. So what we want to do is we want to select these tool paths that you want to pattern. Come up to the top here and select pattern. Now you get a similar dialog box. You can either do a linear, circular, mirror, or duplication. So we want to do a circular pattern. We're going to choose this axis again. We're going to tell it how many times we want it to rotate round. Do five parts. Now this is the important bit. Is we can now choose how we want to order our operation. So we can say preserve order. So that is going to go rough contour, rough contour, rough contour around all the pockets. We can order by the operation. So if there was multiple operations, it would go through the operations the way you have programmed it. Or you can order by tool. So if you've got an operation like a roughing with a 12 and then finishing with an 8 and then doing corners with a 6, it will keep tool order to minimize tool changes. For this, we can preserve the order because we know we want to rough it and finish it and then rotate round to do the next one. So we'll click OK. As you can see, it's now patterned those rounds. So this is an easy way to show you how to do this. To show you how to program a part in HSM. But let's say our designers come along, you said, I need to change this pocket. Can you quickly do this for me? You say, yep, I can do this. So move into our model environment and move this back to model. So our designer said, I need this pocket to be 10 mil smaller. So we find our pocket. Here he is. We open him up and here's our sketch we generated from. So let's make this sketch visible and all the dimension ability has come through with it. We can turn this off if we want, but we want it on for the sake of being able to change it. So without even having to go into this sketch, we can still adjust it using these um, dimensions. So he said he wants this pocket to be 10 mil smaller. So he now wants this pocket to be 20 mil. As you can see, the sketch is updated. The part hasn't. Now up here on the ribbon, you have this ability to locally update the part. So it checks to make sure it checks for changes. It only highlights when there's a change. So it checks for the changes and makes the appropriate adjustments. So let's click it. As we can see, all our pockets have changed size now. So now let's turn the visibility of the sketch off and move back into our cam part, cam environment. As you can see now, this is red X's next to these toolpaths. So it's saying there's something wrong now. It needs to double check to see what has changed. So we regenerate our toolpaths. And as you can see, our face is still facing. Our profile is still in a profile. Our bore is still the same. But our adaptive toolpath should have changed, and it has. It's updated to the size change. And so is our contour. So without having to export, re import, Let's say you want to add a chamfer to this edge. Let's move back into our model. We'll add a chamfer. Let's bung a 4mm chamfer on here. There we go. So we've got a 4mm chamfer on the front now. And again, move back into our cam environment. Regenerate the toolpaths. Regenerate the setup. Yep. Our facing is the same. Our profile is now adjusted to the new chamfer. Our bore is the same, and our adaptive in the clearing is the same. So now let's take this in, run a simulation, you can see the power running. Let's turn off part comparison. As you can see, it's now our simulation is adjusted to the chamfer as well. So it's now seeing this chamfer. Let's get through the bore, and as you can see, we're now getting to this roughing on the side. Our tool orientation has changed. So now we're going to rough out, we'll quickly skip this along. I don't want to sit here in silence. And as you can see, it's now going to run that part all the way through to the end. And we've machined our part other than our holes. So let's machine our holes quick. 
So we don't want the same pattern. I'm going to do it separately. So let's click drill. And it is a 6.8. So let's go for our tools. Go to our sign post library. Don't know if it's 6.8. Here we go. Nice 6.8 drill. And again, we need to change our tool orientation. But instead of having to select a surface, we can just select this and it's going to change our Z. Let's flip it around. So now we need to select our holes. Let's move into our height. Say we want to go through the bottom of the hole by 2mm. It's a favourite of mine to go past. And we want it to do a deep drill with a 2mm pack. Let's quickly simulate that. We have to turn our stock off. And as you can see, it's drilling around. And again, we can pattern this around very quickly using the same thing we did before. We need to do a circular pattern around this axis. Three holes this time. We'll select OK. And you can see it's now done. So now let's post this out. So we've now got our job, we've faced it, we've profiled, we've bored it, we've done the pockets, we've done the drilling. So now we want to post this out to our machine. Let's go up here to post. Change this back to our generic posts. As you can see, with HSM, you get a library of posts. I think it's about 90 posts as standard. And on the CAM posts for Autodesk, you can get even more. So I said we've got a Haas ST30Y. So let's have a look, see if we've got a Haas ST30Y. Um, doesn't look like we do. It's helpful. Um, right then, so let's go and grab ourselves a post. So let's go to Autodesk and we've got this cam library, this post library. We'll search for Haas. As you can see, this brings up all our posts. Now these posts, I would say, are there's a Haas ST30. We can download this. They're all free. Let's uh, show in the folder. Copy this to our desktop. We'll change the destination to our desktop. And you should have a post. It's not showing me the post. To our desktop. That's because it's such a desktop desktop. Here we go. That's SD31. It's because it, when you select desktop, it selects desktop desktop. And to remove the second desktop. So now we have our post. You can see what has ST thirty Y post. We'll post it out. This will pop up with our HSM editor. And as you can see, I've left a note in this that says Sean is the best. With our program number, and this comment is derived from Inventor when you post. It's the comment here: Sean is the best. And this obviously comes in brackets, so it knows, and you get your typical G code post. And this is that program posted out in G code format for a Haas ST30Y. So that concludes the end of our demo. Quick jump back over to PowerPoint. As obviously, we have the last thing, which is questions and inquiries. If you have any questions and inquiries, please contact marketing at man and machine .co.uk. And they'll pass on the questions to the relevant people. So whether it's a technical question, you probably get one of the, myself or one of the other application engineers. Or if it's a marketing or sales thing, then you'll just be moved through to the, the correct salesperson. Other thing we do is at Man Machine, we've got some services. We do training. So we're all we're an authorized training center, and all our all our trainers are Autodesk certified instructors. So we can train you in Inventor, HSM and some of the other products in the collection like AutoCAD and this can be done either on on site or in house depending on um, which training you require so as a Autodesk Platinum partner I'm one of the, we're one of the only resellers who do post development which means we can take a standard post and develop that post to run correctly with your machine this is done in house and on site what we do say though is if we are going to do a post development we have to do at least a day on site to prove that post out to make sure that post is running correctly on your machine 
as trying to do it in-house and trying to send posts back and forth, back and forth, takes too long, too many things can go wrong, so we do say we want to do at least a day on site to post to develop those posts. But if you have any questions with posts, if you're using HSM through ourselves, if you have HSM through another reseller or Autodesk themselves and you want a post developed, please come to us, contact marketing, they'll put you in touch with the right people and we can get a post developed for you. The other thing we do is advanced support, as all the applications here are Autodesk certified individuals, so myself, I'm an Autodesk certified individual on Inventor and HSM. Um, we have Chris who can do AutoCAD and other applications who do other products. So we can do advanced support. So if you're having trouble with your software, whether it be just um, I've re-downloaded the latest um, latest product, so you've upgraded from 17 to 18, and you can't quite get your license to work, we can log in, we can do remote access, we can sort your product, or even if you just have a how-to question, I can't get this chamfer to go on this part, what's wrong with it? Is it just something I'm doing wrong, or is it the software, is it a glitch? We can log in, we can have a look, we can let you know, we'll put you through to the right person, and that person can come and help you out. We can get you up and running again as quickly as we possibly can. We also have a two-hour SLA on that, so we're guaranteed to get back to you within two hours of you sending us a support request. Other than that, I'd just like to say thank you for joining us today, and I hope you have a good evening.